Lane Staley is one of the greatest voices in grunge and metal. Alice in Chains lyrics showcase the real side of substance abuse and mental illness, something Lane knew all too well. Sources say that shortly after Lane was born in 1967, with another source saying when Lane was eight years old, his father, Phil Staley, ran away from his family. Lane's dad's whereabouts were unknown during this time, with Lane reportedly saying, I got a call saying that my dad had died. My family always knew he was around doing all kinds of drugs. Since that call, I was always wondering, where is my dad? I felt so sad for him, and I missed him. He dropped out of my life for 15 years. Another quote was, when I was 16, I tried to find him without saying a word to my family. I did it for a long fucking time, and what I found over the years was not good, so I changed my mind about wanting to see my dad again. After Lane's parents got divorced and Nancy remarried Jim Elmer, Phil would come by occasionally to see Lane and Liz. Eventually, Phil started spending progressively less time with them, leading to a major decision within the family. In Liz's case, she got to the point where she wanted to have a stay-at-home dad. While she and Phil got along, once he started to kind of disappear, she wanted a little more stability and to know that she could count on somebody. We talked with her about being adopted and she liked that idea. The Elmers went through the process so Jim could legally adopt Liz as his own daughter, a decision Phil consented to. Lane felt very differently about the situation, according to Jim. He was waiting for his dad to come back and didn't want to be adopted. However, he would use the Elmer surname throughout high school. Lane grew up calling Jim Elmer dad as he was the only father he ever knew. Lane still cared for his father, but was very hurt by the absence of him. At some point in the early 1990s, after Alice in Chains blew up, Lane's dad reportedly came back into his life after seeing him on the front of a magazine. Lane spoke about this incident, saying, He said he'd been clean of drugs for six years, so why the hell didn't he come back before? I was very cautious at first. Then the relationship changed. My father started using drugs again. We did drugs together, and I found myself in a miserable situation. He started visiting me all day to get high and do drugs with me. He came up to me just to get some shit, and that's all. I was trying to kick this habit out of my life and here comes this man asking for money to buy more smack. In 1992, Lane's dad made a surprise visit to the recording studio where Alice in Chains was recording their top-selling album, Dirt. Lane was happy to see him. Beaming with pride after hearing his son sing, Phil turned and asked, man, where the fuck did he learn how to do that? I just got the chills. The relationship between Lane and his dad was far from good though. Phil had gone from being Lane's father to someone who leached drugs and money off of him. This was just another chapter in the tragic tale of Lane's life. The claim that Phil was using drugs with Lane was backed up by Lane's close friend and Screaming Trees frontman, Mark Lanigan, who told a story in his book, Sing Backwards and Weep. This story takes place in late 1996 or early 1997, after the death of Lane's longtime girlfriend, Demi Perot. Here's Mark's telling of the tale. Not wanting to be alone following the death of his girlfriend, Demi, Lane Staley moved into my place while I was acting the rat on a wheel through a hell tour of Europe. He and my alleged statutory rapist, cross-dressing protege, St. Louis Simon, lived in my apartment smoking and selling crack and arguing with one another over junkie etiquette while I was gone. The first thing Lane said when I walked through the door was, Whoa, man, what the hell happened to you? Let's just say it was a rough fucking ride, I said, and left it at that. I was relieved to have reliable sources of heroin at my disposal once more, and the three of us stayed awake for days on end, alternately hitting the pipe with Simon obsessively scanning the floor looking for what we might have dropped. Lane spent a few more months in squalor with me in my small one-bedroom apartment. He never stopped grieving Demery's death. After a while, his father Phil, also an addict, took up Simon's dubious duties as our runner, which made for a weird dynamic. Lane would often nod standing up, bent over at what appeared to be a painful angle with his head almost to the floor. Nonetheless, he became angry whenever Phil quietly caught a nod sitting on the couch. He would videotape his father, then force him to look at it, cruelly ridiculing his own dad for doing the same thing we all did every day. He obviously carried some resentment of Phil, a man I'd found to be just as sweet, funny, and smart as his son as well as his physical mirror image. Finally, after almost four months, Lane began to crave isolation and moved back into the impenetrable penthouse condo in the university district he had bought 
when I was again by myself. Allison Chains has remained on good terms with Phil since Lane's untimely passing in 2002. Phil made an appearance on stage with Allison Chains in 2013. It seems in the last decade, Phil has cleaned up and gotten sober, although it cannot be confirmed. The last time we heard from Lane's father was in December 2020, when he accepted Lane's Mopop Award on his behalf. I've tried to see where Phil is today, but had no luck. Phil? I, Sean Kinney, of Washington State, we're bringing you this we're late. Congratulations. Well, thank you. I thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of Lane, uh, I want to thank uh, Alice and uh, Mopop for uh, this uh, uh, prestigious award. Um, I also want to say that I am truly blessed to be a part of the Alice family. Uh, truly blessed. And one thing I do know is that somewhere in this world, somebody for the first time is putting on facelift and being blown away. Wow. Alice is truly eternal and evergreen. Thank you.